Hey y'all, it's Bridget Moses from Vincent and Bridget Moses Godly Encouragement here with some more Godly Encouragement for you. We are continuing our uh, second week of our series on the promises of God. The promises of God. And today we are talking about the promise of God's love. It's God's promise to love us. God loves every person he's ever created every person that he's ever created and that's everybody he loves us all the evidence of that love is him creating us with the ability to choose God never forces us to accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior he wants us to choose him of our own free will God's love is not like the world's love his love is unconditional. We are already accepted, approved, loved. When we, when, as soon as we receive Jesus as our Savior, we're always loved. But we are accepted and approved already in Christ. We have that assurance. We're not trying to earn God's acceptance or his approval. We're not trying to do God's word in order to receive his love or to be loved or accepted or approved by him. We already are. We receive all of those truths by faith. The depths of God's love for us is so vast that it is truly unsearchable. God promises us that he will never leave us nor forsake us. His love for us is not contingent on our actions. I'm going to say that again. God's love for us is not contingent on our actions. If it was, then our Heavenly Father wouldn't have sent his only begotten Son, Jesus, to die for us while we were yet in our sin. It's only... It, uh, it's only his love for us that could love us so deeply in the midst of our rebelling from him and our running from him. Imagine how much love it takes to continue to love someone no matter how many times they reject you or mock you. The promises or the promise of God's love is sure it's sure there's no gray area god loves us since the bible says that love covers a multitude of sins and that god is love it's not just what he does it's who he is then we can have the assurance that god's perfect love completely removes our sinful nature when jesus died for us it completely removed it when Jesus died for us on the cross and we received that, it was removed then. But as soon as we received that by faith, then that sinful nature, our nature being a sinful, is removed from us. The more time that we spend basking in God's presence, the more that we're filled with his love for us and the more that flows onto everyone around us. Now that's God's love in action. Now, our sinful nature has been removed. When you, if you've received Jesus, if you've confessed with your mouth and believed in your heart, or confessed with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believed in your heart that God raised him from the dead, then you're saved. Your sinful nature has been removed in your spirit. Your spirit has been recreated, made new. You have now have a carbon copy of Jesus's spirit. Christ's spirit within you. You have to feed that spirit man in order to allow him to be strong enough to lead. Now him, I say him because the Bible doesn't ever say her. The Bible calls us sons. The Bible calls us kings and priests. It doesn't say queens. There is no, in Christ, there is no Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female. Okay? So we are all one in Christ. So Christ is our identity. That's our new identity, Christ. 
okay? Now, does that mean we're always going to be like Christ and Christ-like? No, because we, we have the ability to, but we have to feed that spirit. We've, we've been so busy when we come to Christ. Before we come to Christ, we're so busy feeding our flesh, our carnality, our carnal sinful nature, that we don't understand how to feed our, um, our uh, spiritual nature, our real recreated spirit. Um, we have to feed that. And how do you feed it? With God's word, with reading, speaking, and applying scripture. That's how you feed it. That's how it says washing our minds with the watering of the word, right? That means taking scripture, meditating on his word day and night. We have to meditate on it day and night. That washes ourselves, our soul, which is our mind, our will, and our emotions. Our spirit is perfect. If you've received, if you become born again, and you've confessed with your mouth, with Jesus as Lord, and believe in your heart, God raised him from the dead. Your spirit is recreated into a carbon copy of Jesus's and your spirit, the real you, is made perfect. Okay? Now, we are a spirit. We have a soul, which is our mind, our will, and our emotions. And they're both housed in our body, this earth suit that we live in, our flesh. Now, when you become born again, you have a choice. You get to decide what you feed. Do you feed the spirit? your recreated spirit? Do you allow your spirit man to become stronger and bulked up um, and to uh, lead your life? Or will you feed your carnal nature, your flesh, which is your sensual nature, which just means the five senses, taste, touch, sight, smell, hearing. Okay. We decide that that's on us. Now, the way to feed your spirit man is with God's word, reading, speaking, applying scripture, spending time in prayer, spending time in worship, in God's presence, um, praising God. These all feed our new nature, okay? When we do those things, but just like if you don't eat in the natural, eventually you're gonna get weak, right? That's why we have to do it daily. And I'm talking to myself too, because I'm in the word all the time, but you can be in the, there's a danger of being in the word all the time and not eating to grow. And that's what we need to be doing all the time, all the time, eating to grow, to go, because God's word is forever. I love how uh, my pastor, Dr. Fred Price Jr. says it. His, the word of God is forever pregnant. And I believe that was his father, Apostle Price, excuse me, that started saying that. Um, but the word of God is forever pregnant, giving uh, birth to different facets of revelation, which means you're just learning more and more. There's revelation. There's so much revelation in the word. That's why the Bible says, for now we see dim through a glass dimly. But then we will see clearly. The more that we spend time in the word, the more our eyes, our spiritual eyes, open to God's ways, God's word, God's understanding to an eternal perspective, which is extremely important, extremely. Because the eternity, uh, eternal perspective, uh, completely supersedes the natural realm. The spiritual realm supersedes the natural realm. You have to stay in the spirit to walk above the natural realm, which is possible to do. The Bible says this. It says, do these things and you will never stumble. Do these things and it lists those things and you will never stumble add this to this and this to this and this to this and you will never stumble that's a pretty bold statement that's a promise that is bold and i'm sure uh you know god if if it's god's will we'll get to that one um, because that is powerful you can you mean you can live life without ever stumbling yeah doesn't mean you're gonna not 
you know, bump up against things and, you know, miss it sometimes? No, but it means that you will always move forward in God's, in God's glory. From glory to glory to glory. Now, our, um, our issue is walking things out in our, in our, we have to contend with our soul, right? That's where sin is still, the residue of sin is still present. But that root of the sin has been cut off. It's been removed. The sinful nature has been completely removed. If you've confessed with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart, God raised him from the dead. You put your faith in that, in Jesus, his death and resurrection, and you, Lordship, death and resurrection, and you are saved. You are, you have a new nature. It says we are a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, all things have become new in our spirit. That doesn't mean all the pain and all the, you know, trauma and everything has been wiped away in our soul. It has been in our spirit, so it no longer has a hold on us. But where we contend with the issues of life are in our soul. So it's important. The only way to overcome in the soul, and that's why the Bible says walking out our salvation with fear and trembling, it doesn't mean you're doing that to earn your salvation. It means you have your salvation. Now walk, walk it out in fear and trembling, which means being doers of God's word. When, and we are doers of God's word, not in order to earn our salvation, because that's impossible. We are doers of God's word to, because we are saved, because we're saved, we're able to do these things. And God loves us so much that he doesn't want to leave us in a state less than what he's blessed us with. And we have wholeness available to us. So he will have us contend with those issues in our soul. And we do that through the reading, speaking, and applying of God's word. And which is his, it's not a list of rules. It's his love letter to us. I just saw that on a post on somebody's Facebook and it reminded me of that truth. That that is exactly what it is. And I thought that that was perfect to mention uh, on this video because... And thank you to my Facebook, uh, uh, my Facebook friend for posting that, um, because that is a perfect reminder that God's uh, Bible, the Bible is not a list, a book of rules or things to hinder us. It's God's love letter that gives us, it's God's love letter to us that gives us true freedom, true freedom. And I'm, I'm talking about, we think that we know what we need. We don't. We think that we understand things. We don't. And the Bible says, God is saying, my ways are higher than your ways. My thoughts are higher than your thoughts. Right? Well, where are his ways and his thoughts? How do we know his ways and his thoughts? In his word. In his word. Um, so we have to be in his word to... Um, to know what his ways and his thoughts are and to respond accordingly. But it's not ever to, to um, uh, gain his love, acceptance, or approval because we already have those things. Now, how do we walk in those things? By trusting that we have them. By putting our faith, which is an act of trust, acting on it as though we believe it is so. That's how we walk in it and God's love is so vast and he loves to um, walk us through things a lot of times he doesn't remove things that we go through immediately but he helps us to walk through them letting go of them little by little or healing a little bit by a little bit um, in this fast paced you know get it right now type of society that we live in you know, it can take a minute to get used to God's pace because it's a lot slower than the world's. The world pushes, 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 pushes. Go faster, faster, faster. Do more and more and more. Get more and more. Buy more and more. You know, uh, you know, it, it's not 
it's not God's way. Um, wear yourself out, you know, break yourselves down by doing too much, committing to too much. God's ways are not our ways and his thoughts are not our thoughts. He has so much more for us and we can actually do more when we go at God's pace. We can accomplish more, we can know more, we can be more. Um, and we have more intimacy with God when we're not so busy with other things, when we trust his pace and we trust him. God says, I have restored all the years that the swarming locust, the cutting locust, the chewing locust, and the hopping locust have, I did those in the opposite order, but um, have stolen the great army that I sent among you. When we go at God's pace, he's a God of restoration. He's a God of acceleration. He's a God of multiplication. And he can do a lot more in one minute than we can in an entire lifetime. We just have to trust him. And that is his love for us. Let's get into our scriptures for today, which will be in the description box below. Lamentations 3.22 in the ESV. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. 1 John 4.19 in the ESV, we love because he first loved us. That's why we're able to love, because he loved us first. It's his love. Romans 8.38-39 through in the ESV, For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Romans 5.8 in the ESV says, But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. While we were still sinners, Jesus died for us. That is awesome. That's abundant love. 1 John 4.18 in the ESV, There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not been perfected in love. Jeremiah 31, verse 3 in the ESV, The Lord appeared to him from far away. I have loved you with an everlasting love. Does that ever end? Everlasting? No. Past, present, future. Everlasting. Therefore, I have continued my faithfulness to you. Ephesians 5, 2 in the ESV, and walk in love as Christ loved and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifices, or sacrifice to God. Romans 8, 35 in the ESV, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? Nope, none of those things. 1 John 4, 9 in the ESV, in this the love of God was made manifest among us that God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. You have never lived until you have Jesus. Then you begin to start living because he is the way, the truth, and the life. We actually begin to live when we receive Jesus as our savior. Uh, 1 John 4.16 in the ESV, So we have come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. God is love, and whoever abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. Ephesians 3.17-19 in the ESV, So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. Through faith. That's how he dwells in our hearts, through faith. That you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth of that love, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. What an awesome, awesome prayer. First John 4, 12 in the ESV, no one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. It's through God's love for us and us loving others with that love that other people are able to see God as well. Zephaniah 3.17 in the ESV, The Lord your God is in your midst, a mighty one who will save, who will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you by his love. And he will exult over you with loud singing. 
awesome. He loves us so much. John 3, 16 through 17 in the ESV. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Wow. That's pretty awesome. God's love for us is so powerful. So powerful. And it changes us. It truly does. His love will forever transform our lives if we allow it to. If we receive that love, just because um, you may not feel loved by God right now because of what you're going through. But I want to note um, and, and caution you and exhort you that um, just because what you're going through isn't good doesn't mean that God isn't good. Just because what you're going through is not good does not mean that God doesn't love you. I questioned for a really long time if God loved me um, because I had been through so much pain and hurt. And God had to help me to see that it was not him. It, he was not responsible for that pain and that hurt. That we live in a fallen world. We live in a broken world where sin reigns. The only way that sin doesn't reign is if you become born again. That's the only time sin doesn't reign and everything is expected or um, everything is affected by sin. Everything is impacted. Everything. Our bodies. Um, we were never intended to die. We were intended to be eternal and to live with God. To live and walk with God in a perfect place that he put us in as mankind called Eden which means pleasure. He put us in the place of pleasure to walk and commune with him. Now, that is pretty awesome. That's God's love for us. That was God's plan. Now, uh, Satan in his rebellion and wanting to be God himself um, and his pride decided he wasn't cool with us being created in God's image because he wanted to be created in God's image because he didn't just want to be created in his image he wanted to be him so he deceived us he deceived us as mankind got us to believe that God was holding out on us when God wasn't holding out on us he was just protecting us but why was that tree even there people say if, if God loved us so much, why would he even put it there? Because if he didn't, it wouldn't have been a choice to follow him. We would just have to. God gave us the gift of choice. The best gift and the most loving gift that anyone, any creator could ever give their creation. He doesn't force us to choose him. He wants us to choose him. But it's up to us. God never sends anybody to hell. God never sends anybody to hell. As a matter of fact, hell was never even created for man. It was created for Satan and the angels that rebelled with him, which was a third of the angels in heaven, which is innumerable. It was created for them. It wasn't created for man, but Satan hates man so much because we were created in his image, a tripart being, spirit, soul, and body. God is Father, Son, Spirit. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. So we, uh, we gave up, we fell for the okie doke and gave up our dominion and authority in the earth by believing the lies of a deceiver. And now all flesh, all People are stained with the stench of sin. And unless you, the only thing is God already knew that was going to happen in his preeminence and his foreknowledge. He knew, he knew that we were going to fall for it. And he loves us so much that he put the redemption plan in place before we even fell. 
and that redemption plan is Jesus. God loves us so much that he sent his own one and only begotten son to die for us. To be the atonement, the propitiation for our sins. For our sin. He became sin. He knew no sin, but he became sin and paid the fine that we could never pay. And now we've been restored to dominion and authority in Christ. We've been restored to Eden, spiritual Eden, which is the kingdom of God, which operates above the kingdom of this world and the kingdoms of this world, this world system, which belongs to Satan. But we, are, we don't have to live. We are no longer under that old system. We are under a new system because, and I'm sorry if you hear they're doing some work outside and it's really loud, so... Um, hopefully you can still hear um, hear the the video um, but know that God's love is so vast that he already put a plan into place for us to be returned and restored to right relationship with him it's not about religion it's not it's about relationship with the one who created us and what a powerful awesome thing that is but if we reject the way, the truth, and the life, which is Jesus, and he's the only way to right relationship with God. And God, just like uh, your natural parents, they set up guidelines for their, for their household and how things work in their family. Do you think that they were unloving by doing so? Or were they just trying to protect you and guard you and help you to live the best life possible by creating those rules? It's the same thing with God. God chooses. He, he created everything and he cho chose how it worked, how it was supposed to work. We don't have to receive it. He gave us free choice. He gave us free will. But we get to if we so choose to. And when we do, I'm a living witness, I am a test, walking testimony that when we pursue relationship, not religion, when we pursue relationship with our Creator through a relationship with our Heavenly Father, through gaining access to that relationship through the blood of Jesus and only the blood of Jesus, and then we receive, we're sealed with the Holy Spirit, sealed by the Holy Spirit, and He takes up residence in us. We are the temple of the Holy Spirit, where He is housed, where He lives, where He resides. And we get to have intimacy with God through Holy Spirit, through the Word, which Jesus is the Word wrapped in flesh. And we get to know our Creator. And in doing so, we get to know us. And we see how much He really loves us. And how much He has struggled. Um, just like any parent struggles with their children, you know, when they want to go their own way. Imagine what God has seen. Imagine how God's heart has broken that His children don't want to receive him and and it's not for him it is not for him it's for us because he knows what's best for us because he created us he's been around for all of eternity he existed before we did and it's wise to listen to him and I promise if if there was you know I would I would if there's any other way that worked um, that I found that worked and I tried to find a lot of other ways to God Then I wouldn't go so hard on this, but there aren't There aren't and my life is proof of it My life bears the fruit of the relationship and the intimacy with God through Jesus So I know he's the way the truth and the life and the only way the truth and the life because if the other ways worked then when I tried them I would have gotten somewhere, but I didn't get anywhere, not anywhere whatsoever, other than fearful 
traumatized, um, horror, uh, terrorized, you know, um, depressed, anxious, trying to find other ways to God. They ne it never worked. It was only when I asked Jesus into my life and when I received his help, I asked him for his help and I received it by faith that I was able to do anything different than I was already doing. And he has healed me from anxiety, delivered me from anxiety. He's healed my body. He's delivered me from spirit, the spirit of infirmity that ruled my life for far too long, where everything was about my health and, you know, hypochondriac and, you know, I was in the doctor all the time. It was ridiculous. I haven't been, the only time I've been to the eye doctor twice this year, um, both for an injury to my eye, the same eye, and both within a couple of months. I got a scratch on my cornea from my, my little kiddo, and then um, something bumped me in the eye uh, just a couple months after that. Um, and But other than that, I haven't been to the doctor um, since I was pregnant with my son, which he's a year and a half. Um, and before that, I don't remember the last time I went to the doctor for like a, a health issue. I mean, it must have been probably at least two and a half years um, because God, the Bible, it says, I wish that your soul prospers or your health prospers just as your soul prospers. When we get in the word of God, it is healing to all our flesh. And it actually says that the word of God is healing to our flesh. Um, that's actually, I don't know, that's where I paraphrased it, but it does, I think it says healing to our bones, but it is healing to our flesh. Some versions say flesh, some versions say bones. I promise you, if you commit to giving God as long as you gave the world, and, and you give, you ask Jesus for his help, because he's not going to help us unless we ask him. We got to ask him for his help. And you know what? If you don't believe in God, if you don't believe that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, I just challenge you. I challenge you to ask him that if he is the way, the truth, and the life, if he really is real, that he reveals himself to you. And he's faithful to do it every time. All right, y'all. I've been talking a long time today, and it's about to cut me off. So we'll see you next time. Bye.